morning and Merry Christmas from Bible Baptist Church. Let's stand and sing page 137. We're going to sing all four verses of Joy to the World. Page 137. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him through. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the same. This morning, glad you could be here today. Uh, I'd like to take just a moment and find out if there's anyone today visiting for your first time here at Bible Baptist Church. And yes, ma'am, it's Dora. Is that correct? Dora, but she goes by Jane. All right, and so if you remember, either of those two names are good. And thank you for joining us this morning. And she was here many years ago, uh, moved back from Texas, and uh, joined us this morning. We're so glad you're here today. And uh, anyone else visiting today for your first time? All right, a couple of announcements here. And uh, don't forget, if you didn't realize, there is a table uh, set up to your right just over here with Christmas cards on there. You may want to go by there and see if there's any Christmas cards. Our, our folks, uh, we started doing this years ago, just putting them out before we used to be trying to hand them out to each other. And it just... Uh, uh, got a little confusing, so we put them over there. Make sure you go by, check it out. Uh, you might have a stack of Christmas cards there. Uh, we've been doing this for years. I, I, I don't know, you probably may do the same thing. We we hang our Christmas cards up, and it makes it a decoration. And and so we got a whole stairway full of Christmas cards up right now. And my mother did that growing up, and uh, just uh, the door is just always full of them, and uh, she did that. Uh, maybe we inherited from her. I'm not sure. For other people, I'm sure do that. But make sure you stop by and uh, pick up some of those cards if they're yours. And uh, also, I, I want to let you know that the money we've raised for the Bible Literature Missionary Foundation, we've uh, raised money over support the ministry. This is a printing ministry. They print strictly King James Bibles, and uh, they print them and they send them off free to missionaries around the world or wherever they're needed in the States. They'll have whole Bibles they print, New Testaments, uh, John and Roman booklets, and some other material along the way. And and $1,000 will purchase a roll of paper and print 500 Bibles. And so we, we set a goal to try and raise money to do that. And uh, we came up with $2,266 uh, we raised in that period of time. And uh, that'll print 1,000 Bibles or 400 or 4,000 New Testaments. But along with that, uh, the deacon board also voted on sending 1,000 just from the church um, finances that we had, just send it along. So we sent uh, $3,200, a little over $3,200. So uh, in the printing of 1,500 Bibles, we going somewhere in the world, and uh, they need that money because by faith they started shipping extra loads of paper all last year to come in. So they stepped out on faith, and God provided the finances to pay for all of that. It's somewhere around a hundred thousand dollars. Is that right? No, 
Uh, hold on, let me back up. And uh, let me not give any more numbers because I don't have them right in my head. So, uh, but a truckload of paper costs a lot of money, folks. And the prices have gone up. And uh, so they're really, uh, uh, really concerned. But churches like ours are stepping up and uh, being a blessing and being a help uh, to keep that ministry uh, strong and growing and thriving. And praise the Lord for everybody that helped out and, and did part of helping purchase of these Bibles. Also, um, our Sunday school teachers, there's some material for your Sunday school classes in your uh, teacher's box, uh, wherever that box might be, you teachers know, and uh, they're uh, available to be uh, picked up, used for your Sunday school class. And I want to remind you about tonight. I want you to come back tonight. You say, well, I've been here this morning. That's okay. Uh, you're not doing anything this afternoon. Your team is going to lose anyway, all right? And uh, uh, we don't count on the Steelers winning anymore, do we? We're just hoping they show up. And uh, But I'm from Detroit, so I know I don't count for my team. I just wonder how many points the other team is going to score against them. And uh, But you don't have anything that important. And uh, But tonight will be a blessing to you. And uh, it'll be a wonderful time. Six o'clock, the services start. Uh, our cantata begins. And I want to encourage you to come back. And invite somebody to come along with you. And uh, they may need some encouragement. You know, this time of year is full of blessings. And there's a lot of energy. You can feel it in the air a lot of times, especially I notice it a lot today uh, just here at church. But there are some people are struggling. And uh, some around uh, a church family like this and around the events that are happening centered around our Savior. And it'll be a, a blessing and encouragement to them. So invite anyone, everyone you can. Tell them to come out. They don't want to miss it. They're going to be glad they showed up. And we're glad you're here this morning, Brother Matt. Let's stand and sing page 141. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, page 141. It came upon a midnight clear, that glorious song of old, from angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold. Peace on the earth, goodwill to men, from heaven so graciously, the world in solemn stillness lay to hear the time for us to take our tithes and offerings. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that we can exercise our faith, our trust in you. And Lord, we look to you and you're keeping your promises and your blessings upon us. And, and Father, may you bless the offerings here. May you bless the church. May you bless its, uh, its capacity to do what uh, it would, you want us to do, what you want the church to do. And Lord, uh, please bless this time, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's stand again and sing page 138. We're going to sing all three verses of O Come, All Ye Faithful, page 138. This morning, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. We'll be reading the first five verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Let's have prayer. Father, thank you for this morning and for those that could be here today, Lord. And uh, I pray that you will uh, use this message, Father, to speak to us, minister to us, Father, in ways we are not even, even aware of, that we need your help. And may you bless this morning, may you bless this time. I need your help today in Jesus' name, amen.
the way. I need some elbow room, amen, and uh, this preaching business, you got to have some room. Thank you for shutting that door. It was like the black hole I was looking at over there, amen. I was <laughs> going to ask you to get that for me. And, uh, you know, the emphasis on Christmas, what is it for most people? I think for a lot of folks, it's uh, wanting to get the Christmas right. Everything has to be right. We've got to have a white, bright Christmas. We want the tree and the decorations, the lights. And I'm not sure if you still use the eggnog or not. We want everybody to be happy. We just want everybody to have a good time, family to come together, no problems. We want peace. We want joy to abound. In reality, though, as you know, Christmas often turns into a, a hassle. You are rushed, you're pushed for time, you spend money you don't have. In our struggle to get it right, we oftentimes, for Christmas, we get it all wrong. Get it all wrong. And the others around us, miserable. And so people don't want to get together for Christmas. They oh, we have to go through that again. Now, this is the way I think a lot of people are, are leaning. I think this is the way a lot of people think about Christmas. Now, I believe God wants us to get Christmas right. I believe that he's not interested in us having a white Christmas. And by the way, I am not interested in white anytime, amen? And uh, white Christmas, he's uh, interested, though, in having our Christmas right. He wants us to have it right. So how can we do that? How is it possible for us to, to achieve these things that the Lord wants for us? What do we do? Well, we need to understand uh, what we, we do, we need to understand and change our lives that will allow Christmas time to be a blessing and a wonder instead of being a time of stress and tension. Now, you know what I'm talking about. Some of the get-togethers you do just because it's family. You do because it's, you're supposed to, and you're really not looking forward to it. Now, this is not what the Lord wants. He doesn't want that. I want our Christmas to be this way. This passage truly reveals some ingredients that are absolutely essential. If we are going to have a right Christmas now, I realize this. I realize this is not a traditional Christmas message. I am not in Luke right now. I am not in Matthew right now reading about uh, the events of our Savior's birth. I'm, I'm over in John. He didn't even uh, um, really mention that area. Uh, but I understand that. Now, John does not write about angels, shepherds, stars, or any of those things. But he does something that the other gospel writers do not do. John puts a great uh, Christmas or a, 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 the greatest Christmas delivery of all time in context in this passage we looked at here this morning. Now, you're going to look at your Bible and say, how does this, <laughs> this passage, how does this talk about Christmas? How does this talk about our, our Savior's birth? Well, let's find out this morning. I'm going to take you on this journey where Paul uh, or John has shown us. Notice it says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Let's stop right there. Christmas time, or Christmas is filled with many distractions between personalities and the presence and the practices, it's easy to forget the real reason of this day. Of course, this day is coming up at the end of the week. Verse 1 brings us all back to the real essence of Christmas. Because when we look over in verse 14, it tells us, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So verse 1 really brings us back to the essence of, of what Christmas is. First of all, what we see here is in the beginning was the Word. And we first look at this and we, we understand that Christ is the eternal God. He is the eternal God. This phrase does not imply the Word had a beginning. And you know, we look at that and say in the beginning, uh, in the beginning was the Word. It's not saying the Word had a beginning. Uh, it means that the Word has always existed. It has always existed. The Word was, that we find in here, uh, in the beginning, was the Word. The Word was, and let me use a little bit of, of definition here. It's used in an imperfect tense. 
And you know right where we're going now. No, you don't know what I'm talking about. All right. It goes back to the Greek word. And it signifies an action of the past that continues into the present. It could read this way, which it, we're not changing the Bible, but to understand it, in the beginning was the Word, is the Word, and always will be the Word. It always has existed, the Word has. And uh, it, no, no beginning, no start of it, nothing like that. The Word is eternal. It always has been. He has always been and He always will be. Before there is anything else, there is the Word. Before anything else. Jesus had His birth in Bethlehem, but not His beginning. That was not the beginning of Jesus. You know, before there was a universe, He was. Before there was a star, galaxies, anything that ever existed, he was. Jesus is not plan B. <laughs> he was not a second choice of events happening. There never was another plan. This was the only plan. And in the beginning, and the total existence of all things, before there ever was anything else, the Word existed. A few months before Christmas, a wife of a mail carrier was killed in a car accident. The husband was overcome with grief and trying to work through his sorrow. And working through that sorrow, he began to st he stayed light, late at the post office and sorting through the mountain of mail that always came through at Christmas time. His job that day was to go through the mail that had been lost and to find out where it should be rerouted. He came across a letter addressed to Santa Claus. He noticed the address at the top of the letter was his own address. So he opened the letter, looking down at the bottom of the page, he saw his only daughter's signature. The letter read, Dear Santa, my mommy died two months ago, and since then my daddy has been crying himself to sleep every night. He says only eternity will help him. Would you please send a little bit of eternity to my dad this Christmas time? Well, let me point out something here. Not only, uh, now, God not only sent us a little bit of eternity, He sent us the very heart of heaven in Jesus Christ. John put it this way in his epistle when he wrote 1 John uh, chapter 4, he said, And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And so what we see here, not only that, but He is equally God. Jesus is equally God. The Word translated, the, uh, the Word, the Word, the Word, and uh, uh, the Word translated Word here, in the beginning was the Word. That Word uh, means in the Greek, logos, which is, simply is defined, it refers to speech, reasoning, explanation, a word about something. Now, I'm going to get a little detail, so just Stay with me just for a moment here. Now, stay with me the rest of the morning, please, but focus a little bit more right now. And uh, Okay, we're done. We'll drift off. And uh, it refers to speech, reasoning, and explanation, a word about something. That is who Jesus is. He is called the Word because a word is a visible expression of an individual, uh, of an invisible thought. Jesus is the perfect ex expression of who God is. Jesus is everything God has ever said or will say. He is everything God, everything God is about in human form. Now, uh, listen to me on this. In John chapter 1, verse 18, the same chapter, it says, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Now, I want to stop for a moment. And, and see, these words are wonderful. That's why uh, we got to have the right words, amen? Uh, we have to have a Bible with the right words because the words are very important. The word here, declared. Now, who would stop and, and, and uh, look up that word? Now, that word declared means to lead out, to explain, or to narrate. We get the word exergesis. Now, a lot of people don't even know what that is, but uh, Jesus is the explanation. He is the or narration of God. People say, well, I want to understand God. Everything about God you're going to know or understand is found in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ 
is God. He is the Word. He always has been. Everything that is said about God is in Jesus Christ. The word with in verse 1 that we looked here, the word was with God. It means the word, that word uh, with means face to face or toward. It tells us that Jesus is face to face with God. In other words, it tells us that Jesus is equal to God. He is the same person. He is the same person. This reminds us that God we serve is a triune God. There is one God who manifests himself in three persons. The Word, Jesus Christ, is one of those manifestations. But we also find out about him, he is essentially God. The statement, and the Word was God, is the clearest statement of deity of Jesus in the Bible. Not only the word co-eternal and co-equal to God, the word is God. That is why Jesus could say uh, the things that he said in John 10, 30, when he said, I and my Father are one. Yeah, I cannot say literally that I and my human Father are one. It just isn't true. Only Jesus can say that is 100% accurate that Jesus and the Father are one are one. When God sent his son into the world, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, when God sent his son into the world, he sent one who is eternally, equally, and essentially God himself came into the world. In other words, when we look at what the angels declared in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. They were announcing the birth of God in human flesh. God came down uh, as a uh, invisible to us, but he came down in flesh, born into this world in a human body. And the amazing things... <laughs> The magnitude of what we're talking about here this morning. God is bigger than everything you and I can ever imagine. He's bigger than, the Bible says he's bigger than the universe itself. There's no stage that God could go upon to reveal himself. He is bigger than everything. But he is compressed down into an infant in that manger in human flesh. That's astounding. That's amazing when you think about that. All through his life, he proved who he was over and over. From peace be still, to rise up and walk, to Lazarus come forth, to thy sins be forgiven thee, until it is finished. The truth and the power of his deity was on constant display while he walked on earth. Every word, every deed, every miracle declared him to be God. He alone is the person of Christmas. He alone is the person of Christmas. Look, folks, we think Christmas is about all these other things that we're trying to create in our living rooms. We're trying to create in our offices and at the workplace. We're trying to create Christmas, but we, we fail to realize that Christmas is Jesus. It is Jesus. Now, let's go to my second point. That's point one, amen. We got to get a move in here this morning. I want you to consider the power of Christmas with, you, uh, with me this morning. In verse 3, we notice in John chapter 1, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That, that, that says a lot right there. People have a lot of questions about that, but really it answers itself. There's no more really to, to say about it. If I were to ask you to tell me what you think of the greatest manifest, manifestation of God's power, you might have a different answer. You might say it is in creation or in his miracles, or one would talk about the cross, and still others would center on the resurrection. But I want to submit to you that the greatest expression of God's power was when he added humanity to his deity and came to live and die among men. Think about this for a moment, if you will. Just who was born in that manger in Bethlehem? Just think about that. He is the maker of creation. When you consider that this verse tells us that Jesus was the creator of the universe, his birth as a baby becomes even more amazing because the creator of creation humbled himself and became a creature 
in creation, and God became dependent upon a human mother. Jesus, who is the agent of creation, stepped out of eternity, laid aside his glory, and entered into a world as a human baby. That is the power behind Christmas. That's amazing. It's mind-boggling when you consider it and think about it. And you, you say, what is uh, all of this power? What is this? This is God becoming flesh, creator becoming creation. That is why this season is not about trees, or if you dare still use tinsel. It's not about packages and parties. It's not about boxes and bows or meals and mistletoe. The season is about him. He is the maker of creation. He is the master of creation also. Not only did he make this universe, but his power, he, uh, uh, but he is the power that holds it all together. I want to read uh, two verses for you, found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. What a statement. That word consist means, as one man put it, the glue of the galaxies. He made it, and he holds it all together, too. Do you realize it's not, not in your power to hold everything together? It's only in Christ's power that can do that. We try and fix so many things and do so many things without Christ involved in what we're trying to have. You know, Life is held together, marriages are held together, families are held together, churches are held together, countries are held together, nations are held together because of the power of Christ. By Him, all things consist. By Him, all things are held together, all things are put together. When I, I counsel anybody in marriage in my office, first thing I do, I come out with the word. We're not going any further than this if you cannot hear the word. If you cannot submit to the word, then nothing's going to consist in your life. Nothing's going to be held together in your life. You're going to be trying to do it humanly as much as possible. And people say, well, I'm just a nervous wreck. Why are you a nervous wreck? By Christ, all things uh, are created. And by him, all things consist. And uh, you want to get over being a, 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 a mental wreck and not holding together? Well, you need to include Jesus, the creator of all into your life, make him the center of your world. And, and you might find the things that you cannot handle come together and are held together. My wife and I have been married 30, we think 35 years. We're try, we can't keep count very well. And uh, this marriage is not held together by her nor me. We're both pretty hard-headed, opinionated, strong-willed, and if on our own, one of us would have died within the last 35 years. It would have been her. And, uh, but, and, uh, well, unless I wasn't looking, amen. It just wouldn't. Why? Because we're flesh. We're full of sin. We're corrupt. We're wicked. Say, oh, no, there's good in everybody. There's no good in anybody until Christ becomes part of your life. We do good things. Yeah, it's trying to do good things to make ourselves look good or get some sort of gain. There's always a sin behind it. Why do people do good things nowadays and post it on Facebook? Praise, Praise a man. The pride of man. The egotism. I want everybody to know that I'm a good person. I do good things. Why do we post that thing? Because we're corrupt. We're wicked. We say, I don't want to be that way. But we are. And that's why nothing can consist in humanity. That's why we're having trouble in our government today. We're having trouble in our nation today. Because we've stopped being a moral nation, worshiping God. Now we've become a nation of finances and money and currency. And we don't care about anything else. Well, I'm not saying us. Maybe you're not that way. But I'm talking about our, our, uh, the government leaders that we have right now. 
You say, what, what's going to fix that? Well, they're, trying, they're attacking God, attacking the churches, trying to shut out uh, Christianity, and, and they're trying to remove him. And you watch, they continue to do that. There will not be the United States of America. There will be divided states of America. But we're not talking in that today. We're pointing out that everything consists. Think of it this way, if you will. Man can't really make anything that runs as it should. All right? Well, it's supposed to work. I bought I spent this. Well, it's supposed to, but it doesn't, does it? But take a look at our greatest planet and realize, our, our great planet, realize that it does not travel in a true circle. More than one hundredth of a second every one hundred years. And we can only say that Jesus is in control. We look at the building blocks of the universe, which is an atom. The, enti the, the entity is so small that each atom is less than one, 150 millionth of an inch. That's small, folks. I have to get my reading glasses on to see that. 150 millionth of an inch in diameter. If you would take the molecules of one single drop of water, convert them into grains of sand, there would be enough sand to build a concrete highway a half a mile wide. That's a lot of traffic, amen? That's a lot of lanes. A half a mile wide, one foot thick from New York to San Francisco, and there are 120 drops of water in a single teaspoon. Combine that with the fact that one cell of your body contains 200 billion molecules in atom, of atoms. Whether you look at the universe with a telescope and see how big it is, or you look at the universe with a microscope and see how small it is, when you see the order, you see the cemetery, uh, cemetery uh, you see the harmony, you see the beauty of all that it is, only a fool would fail to conclude that God did it and that God is in control. You know, we... Having control for us is an illusion. It's an illusion. I'm in charge. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I set some rules up there obeying me. Again, no, they're not. <laughs> we have this idea that we can control a situation or a, a person. You can't. You can't. We don't have that power. Only Christ can do that. Only Christ can control this world. You know, people say we have climate change. Well, welcome to life in the world for the last 6,000 years. <laughs> it's been changing every day for 6,000 years. No two days are identical. There's always a change. The night is different. Now they're trying to tell us that we have to give money because our government can change the climate. And we're saved. are we? Look, that is man without God. That is man not even considering God. Man living in the delusion in himself that he can control something. You know, what does it all mean? Well, it simply means this. God is in control this Christmas. God is in control. It may look like our world is spinning out of control, but it isn't because it's in the hands of the one who made it all and the things are working toward the purpose who, which uh, he designed them for. You say, well, I want things to change. No, no. The Bible tells in Matthew but before the coming of Christ, before the tribulation, uh, that things will wax worse and worse. Well, I don't want things to wax worse and worse. I'm sorry, but it's in God's control. Uh, and God's doing all of this right now. And uh, uh, he has a purpose behind it. The one who made it all, controlled uh, and controls it all, was born in the world 2,000 years ago as a helpless infant. He lived in poverty and rejection, only to die a horrible death on a cross. He did it all because... He loved you. So what is the power of Christmas? Well, the power of Christmas is God in a manger. And that is the power of Christmas. The reason we celebrate this day, that is the essence of the whole reason that we come together and celebrate this. 
I want you to consider the purpose of Christmas. Notice in verses 4 and 5. You still there with me in, in Gospel of John? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The question that begs to be asked is, why? Why did the Creator desire to become part of creation? Why did God put on human flesh and walk among men? Why did he come into the world to live and to die? What is the purpose of Christmas? What are we celebrating? Why are we celebrating him coming here? Well, first of all, he came to bring life to deadness. When Jesus came to this world, he entered into this world, a world filled with dead men. But these dead men didn't know they were dead. They thought they were living life. Jesus came so that dead men could live, and when Dead, uh, when a dead lost man meets Jesus, he passes from life unto death, the Bible says. He passes from a life of death now into a, a real life now. Jesus <coughs> is the strength of an earthly life. See, we are alive today only by God's good grace. That's all it is. You and I could all stand up here and, and say, you know, I nearly had this accident. I nearly died. I, I wonder why my heart's still beating and this and that. And Jesus is the strength of our life. He's the strength of our life. Look, you can eat all the granola bars you want. Run around the world to stay in shape. You know, drink all the water in plastic bottles and been sitting in a hot truck for a month. And say, I'm getting healthy, I'm drinking. All, do all that you want to. But you know what happened years ago? Time of rural America, people on them farms, people out there working every day of their life, frying their eggs up, frying their bacon up, eating biscuits, gravy, just living life, eating what they want. What happened to them? They lived to be 90 years old. Now we're doing all this stuff right now. We think we have the power of life. Well, I'm going to live to be 90 years old. Well, I'm going to go eat bacon, fried eggs, and biscuits. Amen? And it seemed to work for that generation. So uh, why well, want to work for my generation? I might be a little rounder when I die. Amen? And a little larger. Uh, but I'm still going to live just as I lived. And, and uh, you know, we, we have this idea that we have this power and control over all these things. But Christ is in control of our life. He's the power of our existence. Jesus is the secret of an effective life. It has been said that three things make life worth living. A self fit to live with. A faith fit to live by. And a purpose fit to live for. Only Jesus can give you all three. In John 10.10 10, he says, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And uh, he gives life, and he gives life abundantly. His word tells us uh, the word abundantly means superior. It means extraordinary, surpassing the common. Yeah, I want to live a life. I want to have joy and happiness. I want to have a purpose. And that is what Jesus has done. That's why he came to give us that type of life, not just the average life of people uh, muddling through this whole world and trying to find happiness and existence and a purpose. You, you know why? We have all this activism today. People are trying to find a purpose. They have, they have no idea even what the issue is. They don't even know why they're standing out there holding a sign that somebody handed them. I've listened to some of these college students being interviewed about why they're out there today, and they're giving answers and reasons that weren't even the reason they were there. They have no purpose, but they're looking for a purpose. This is what mankind is doing. We're trying to save a tree frog. We're trying to save a whale. We're trying, you know, we're doing all this. Well, we let babies die by the multitudes. But we're looking for a purpose. Jesus said, I can give you a better life than this whole world could ever offer you. And that's why, one of the reasons I came. This kind of life he came to give us. I uh, Give us a life with a purpose. And I thank God he gave me a purpose when I got saved. I was a young man, really wandering, didn't know where I was going, what I was doing, get a job one day, make some money, you know, and maybe somebody will marry me, I don't know, and uh, you know, get a house and die. I figured that's what life is all about, and trying to have fun in between. 
Um, but you know, I had no purpose. Uh, but when Christ saved me, he gave me a purpose for my life, my existence. But I want to say also, Jesus is the source of eternal life. Those who know Jesus by faith will live eternally. Because the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He makes life permanent. See, real living is more than walking, talking, eating, breathing, loving. Real life, abundant life, is a joyful life, is found in knowing Jesus Christ, God's Son, is found in that. And let me say something, though. Let me add on to what that thought there. It's not just knowing Him, but surrendering to His way. Well, I want to do my sin first. I, want to, I don't want to live that way. Then you will not have the abundant life. You'll not have the joyful life. You'll just have life like everybody else, but you're going to heaven. But you have no purpose. You have no reason for your life. You're going to bounce around and be unhappy, generally. You'll find moments of joy or happiness for a few moments, but that won't be life. He came to bring light in the darkness. Now, a person who does not know Jesus is more than just spiritually dead. He's also spiritually darkened. Jesus came to change all of that. He said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus came to deliver the lost from the darkness and to bring them into his glorious light. Let me read a couple uh, verses for you here, expressing that in Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. Colossians 1, 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Jesus came into this world to bring light into our spiritual darkness. Just as he stood in the darkness of creation and said, let there be light, there was a day when he stood in this old cold darkness of my heart to bring light unto my soul. Listen to what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 4, For God who hath commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge and the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What is sad is the world stumbles around blindly in the dark, seeking a light, all in the wrong places. They're looking in all the wrong places. The lost world does with the light. They reject it when it comes their way. You know, people say, no, I don't want to get saved today. No, I don't want that gospel track. No, I don't want to come to church today. No, I don't want you knocking on my door. No, I don't want you praying for me. No, I don't want that. They reject it over and over. Yeah, and through the years, I've had some people very harshly reject Christ in a form of rejecting me being there and kind of told me what they thought of me being there. And, but you know the sad thing is? They're blinded. They're in a world of darkness. Well, one day, when this life is over on earth, they're in eternity and hell, they're going to remember all those moments of rejection. I rejected the altar call. I rejected the gospel track. I rejected my mother's prayers. I rejected, it'll go on and on. My coworker talked about, I reject all, all that's going to happen. But Jesus came to deliver all men from that. John 3, 19, for this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Their deeds were evil. We look at verse 5 in, in um, uh, John chapter 1. It says, and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. That word comprehend it means to lay hold on, <coughs> to claim for oneself. When the light came, they did not claim it. They did not receive it. They know it's a truth, but they put it off. They know salvation is through Jesus Christ, but they didn't claim it as their own. They walk around with this hyper-spiritualism and say, well, I've always believed in him. Well, the Bible also says the devil believes in, in him, but he trembles. Because the devil has rejected him as God and will spend eternity in hell. Man may know of his existence and of his purpose 
and everything about him, but they do not receive him personally as Savior. They reject it, that light. And they'll be separated in eternity from God forever. But Jesus came to save us from all of that. The lost world is actively trying to quench the light, to prevent the light from shining anywhere. Oh, you can't bring your Bibles to school. No, you can't hand the gospel tracts out at work. No, you can't talk to anybody on our, our property about the Lord. That You can't keep religion out of this. And, and they stop it and they, they thwart it. You know, we, there's signs all over people have. Uh, what, what are those things? No, um, no soliciting. Does anybody know what solicitation is? Somebody tell me what it is. It's selling something, right? It's selling something. But they say, You're, you can't do this. I say, I'm not selling anything. But you can't do this, but you can't sell anything. Uh, but the law is on our side because one person cannot speak for an entire apartment building. Only the, ind only the individual can reject it. They cannot reject it for them. Or a trailer court or anybody, anywhere else where there's housing. One person can't reject that. But see, that's what the world is trying to do. You can't have that. You can't do that. But I have bad news for them. Because light has shone brightly from eternity past. The light has gleamed into Bethlehem's manger. The light has shone now for 33 years while Jesus walked on earth. That light that flickered briefly on Calvary but blazed forth at the entrance uh, to an empty tomb continues to light the pathway to eternity for all those who desire to follow him for all those who desire to know him. You know, the world's trying to do what they can, but they can't stop the light. They can't stop it from coming. Most folks are all messed up when it comes to what they think about uh, what Christmas is all about. All messed up. Their primary concern is getting the perfect gift. And you know, only God can do that. Only God can give the perfect gift, and that is just what he did when he sent his son, Jesus, into this world. He gave us Jesus, the greatest gift. He gave Jesus to be a life for our dead souls, to lighten our darkened heart. He gave us all when he gave us his son, Jesus. You say, boy, I just want a perfect Christmas. I want Bing Crosby singing, White Christmas. I want snow falling down and Everybody have a little scarf on and run into a warm house of fire. That's not Christmas, folks. That's Hollywood. That's imaginary. You know what happens when people come to your house on a snowy day? They bring snow in the house. Snow melts into water. They got in the dirt, it turns into mud. And now the, the Christmas footies you are wearing are soaking wet. Your feet are wet. Your house is dirty. You spent a week cleaning it for company. Look, all this thing the world is rushing to try and claim and have, they never find it. They never find it. Why? Because we're looking in the wrong place. This is the center of everything that you do. You having a turkey? No, they don't like turkey. We're having a ham. No, put Jesus at the center of everything. And here's how you can guarantee yourself a right Christmas this year. Let me, let me give you four real quick, three, three real quick points. First of all, be sure you're saved. Be sure you know him as your personal Savior and uh, that you pass from death unto life. Be sure that uh, you're headed for heaven. You don't have just the head knowledge of him, but you have the heart because you've received him by faith. Secondly, be sure this day is about him not about anything else. Not about anything else. You know, we're at a point in our life that we can't buy for our children what they can't buy but better for themselves. What's the perfect gift for them? I can't get it. It's impossible. But Jesus is that perfect gift because it's about him. And thirdly, three fingers, thirdly, be sure to give him the glory. He is due today and every day. Give him the glory. Let's not make it all about these things. Because we're missing. We're missing what Christmas is all about. I love the beautiful decorations up here. It looks wonderful. It's what we say Christmas is supposed to look like. But truly it's not. Tradition, we do it. But it's truly about Jesus Christ. 
Let's bow our heads, please, this morning. Every head bowed and every eye closed. This morning, as we looked at what a right Christmas is, has he spoken to your heart today about anything? Well, maybe you're not sure about eternity yourself. Have you passed from death into life? Maybe you're not sure you're going to heaven when that time comes, when you die. But Jesus can give you that assurance. He can give you that eternal life today. It could be yours. Maybe today you feel him pulling at your heartstrings. Maybe speaking to you about this matter. You, you have some fear about the unknown death. You say, I don't know about that. Well, we want to help you. Now, I want to pray for you if there's anyone like that. I'm not name names, but if you're concerned about that, would you slip your hand up and say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure about eternity if I'm saved. I'm going to heaven for sure. Anybody like that at all? But also, I want, if God spoke to your heart about the next step of your Christian life, have you followed the Lord in believer's baptism? The very next step is to identify with Him before others. To be unashamed of what He's done for us and what He's, he's done for us by dying for us. Maybe the Lord has spoke to you about the need of baptism. Maybe the need of church membership. You've been coming for a while, but church membership has to come through, first of all, salvation, then baptism, the church membership. But God has dealt with you about becoming a member of the church. But folks, let me ask you this question. Are you looking in the right place this year? Maybe God has spoke to you about something this morning. Maybe you're carrying a burden that's a bit much for you to carry today. Maybe you need his comfort, his help, his strength. And that's this invitation will be about many things. And Father, we come to you right now. And, and Lord, may you minister to us, speak to us, and help us, Father, to hear your voice. And if there's someone here not knowing you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that you will deal with them about that. I pray that they'll come forward, that we can take the word of God and show them. Now, Father, I pray that you'll bless this invitation. May your will be done in each one of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together as our pianist plays this morning. The altar is open. The invitation is given. If you just need to take a moment to pray, you carry a burden. There's some things God dealt with you about today. Let's not go out the door with unfinished business. business. What is it? Bring it to the Lord today. Maybe just this will make you refocus a little bit about Christmas Day, Christmas morning. Maybe we want our children to really be focused on what Christmas is all about. It's about Jesus. had to focus for ourselves, remind ourselves it's all about Jesus also. you can go ahead and look this way. Thank you for coming this morning. Glad that you were able to make it uh, 
today, and I, I want to encourage you to come back tonight, too. Uh, it's going to be a special time, our cantata, and a lot of work, a lot of effort's been taken into it to be a blessing. And I hope you'll come back this evening. Don't forget it. Check your mail over there, amen. Somebody might have dropped some mail off for you, and they're sneaking, we're sneaking around the post office, amen. No stamps over there. But uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here this morning. Brother Matt, would you come? Lead us our song. Let's sing Let's Talk About Jesus. It's in the front cover of your hymnal. Let's talk about Jesus. 